Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate, one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Today on the AMFT Podcast, we're talking family rituals and family secrets with Evan Ember Black. Rituals are powerful tools for creating bonding, and giving our clients homework around rituals can be a powerful therapeutic intervention. Of course, therapists must make sure the rituals make sense given the context and the cultural backgrounds of our clients. Beyond creating positive change, Rituals are a tremendous exploratory tool because through them, it's possible to find out more about a family's values and belief systems, as well as possible exceptions in the midst of some chaotic relationships. Rituals of themselves can be healing. Now, if rituals can be healing, secrets can be damaging. Secrets are complex. Because of their complexity, secrets are resistance to simple rules. Therapy must compromise more than opening up the secret or addressing only the context. As therapists, we're confronted with the difficult task of examining our own values around secrecy, while at the same time providing an effective therapeutic environment. Some secrets are meant to be kept. Sometimes secrets exist within subsections of a family. Sometimes secrets are within the individual and the possible if they could come out, the fear is it could blow up the family as we know it. So today we're going to have a really thought-provoking conversation with Evan Ember Black. She is a notable figure in our field, a longtime faculty member at the Ackerman Institute, former director of Ackerman Centers for Family and Health. Evan is currently a professor and program director of the MFT Master's Program at Mercy College and was a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx. Dr. Ember Blank was the editor of Family Process, as you'll hear us talk about today, which is uh, one of our top scholarly journals in family systems from 2004 to 2011. In addition to her work in family therapy training and practice, Evan teaches scholarly and popular writing for family therapists who want to publish their ideas. She was the previous director of the Family and Group Studies Program, providing systemic training to psychiatric residents, and the founder of the director of the Urban Institute for Families and Family Therapy at Einstein. This innovative institute provided family systems training for frontline mental health workers who were called upon to see the most difficult family situations with no training to do so. An institute without walls, the Urban Institute provided live supervision in clinics and hospitals throughout the Bronx. And listening to the interview today, you will get a sense of Evan's journey and the powerful and important people that influenced her work. And she is known for these two topics today family rituals, and family secrets, and we give a nice introduction to both if you're unfamiliar with Evan's work. She's the past president of AFTA, that's the American Family Therapy Academy. She's a recipient of the AFTA Award for Distinguished Contribution to Family Therapy Theory and Practice, and she is the 1999 recipient of the AAMFT Cumulative Contribution to Marriage and Family Therapy Award. Really enjoyed this interview and we'll be back at its conclusion. Eli, back with you on the AAMFT podcast. I am really happy to be joined today by Evan Ember Black and we're going to have a nice conversation spanning her illustrious career and talking about some things that she's really known for in the field, including family secrets and family rituals. But be first, Evan, our first question is always, how did you decide to become a systemic couple and family therapist? It's a wonderful question. I was working with stranger groups, with encounter groups. Believe it or not, the 
federal government was funding us to research in counter-group leadership, can you imagine? And I grew weary of working with stranger groups and really stumbled upon the field of family therapy. And I was just grabbed by it. This is what I needed. This is what I was looking for. And it was at the same time that I was moving from California to Pittsburgh to do my doctorate at the University of Pittsburgh. And there, this particular doctoral program let us plan our own program. So I was able to really dive into family therapy. There was no couple therapy at that point. Everything was subsumed in family therapy. And my dear friend, the late Carol Anderson, was also at Pittsburgh at that point. She was running a wonderful program at Western Psych and brought in probably every leader in family therapy at that time to be able to learn from. And so it was just a terrific experience. I did my internship in the Steel Valley and worked with couples and families who worked in steel mills there, and I think I I learned more from them than I can ever thank all these people for. These were, of course, all working class people, both white and people of color, and that was my learning. I'm sure that was a big change coming from, uh, geographically coming from California, going to Pennsylvania. Where are we in time? Locate us here in a year. This was uh, 1971. We think of the the golden age of family therapy. We certainly think of the decade of the 70s. So you mentioned Carol. We'll maybe talk about her in a second. Who else influenced you early in your career? It's been said, you know, once you think systemically and once you have that language, you can think no other way. Who were your early influences? I think, you know, like everybody in that decade, it was mostly the men, (laughs) Sal Mnuchin, Jay Haley, people like that. Those were the people, Murray Bowen, that were really still in the process of inventing family therapy. So I was very lucky to come along when I did and be able to learn from all of these people and then begin to be part of the development. You know, we talk about this patriarchal, male-driven MFT world, and then the feminist critique comes around in the late 70s and early 80s and turns MFT on its heels and the whole postmodern movement as part of that. So how did the feminist critique in the early 80s impact your work? Oh, greatly. I I was fortunate to be part of that group. You probably have heard of the Stonehenge conferences that Monica McGoldrick and Carol Anderson and Froma Walsh. Uh, We've had had, uh, Monica and Froma on the show, and they have talked very fondly uh, about those great meetings, which you were a part of. Tell our listeners what that was like and what the purpose of the Stonehenge meetings were. It was 40 women leaders in family therapy brought together to an inn in Connecticut called Stonehenge, which is how it got its name. And we spent three or four days together uh, presenting our work, what each of us were doing with women in families at that time. I presented my own work on larger systems and how women in particular were often excoriated by various larger systems and how to work with that. And and so both of these conferences in Connecticut were just groundbreaking. The late Olga Silverstein encouraged us to count all of the women on the journal boards of Family Process and JMFT and also on the professional organizations, AAMFT and AFTA. No great surprise, it was about 80 to 90 percent men, white men, and we made up our minds that we were going to change that. And we did. It took probably about 15 years to get it to a point where it was much more even. Certainly in my own editorship of Family Process, I was very conscious of making sure that 
the editor, uh, review editors were women and men and people of color. And so that, that all came out of those Stonehenge meetings. Then Betty Carter, the late Betty Carter, and Monica McGoldrick and myself sponsored a world conference of women. It was in Denmark, but we had women from Asia and Africa and Europe and the United States looking at women's issues in family therapy, and it was remarkable. Both Monica and Froma shared with me how many great collaborations came out of that just short period of time, and uh, not only publications, but kind of lifelong friendships and partnerships. What is your favorite memory from that Stonehenge group? I think the, the what I just commented on of Olga, so the late Olga Silverstein, insisting to us that we needed to do this. It seemed like a funny idea, count everything, but wow, did it ever make a difference. She also encouraged us to really watch the literature carefully, watch it for articles that were uh, non-feminist, shall we say, and write responses. You know, as the second female editor behind your predecessor, Carol Anderson, of the most historic and oldest family therapy journal, Family Process, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that job and to kind of be a purveyor of the field and shape how knowledge about family therapy and systems is procured and disseminated. What from your period as editor are you the most proud of? I think what I'm most proud of is the work that I did to bring new authors into the field. I paid a lot of attention to that, to uh, encouraging uh, people who were afraid to submit to family process, watching the work of younger colleagues, uh, helping them to write. And that has then morphed, if you will, into since I left the editorship, every year I do a new writer's conference for 10 young scholars that the Family Process Board selects. I'm not part of the selection process. And they submit proposals, and 10 are chosen from across the country, and and actually from some uh, foreign countries as well. And we're having our meeting in about three weeks. We meet on a Thursday for about five hours and then all day Friday. This year it'll be virtual, but normally it's in person. And then they get to meet the board of the Family Process Institute at the end, which is really wonderful and very exciting for all these young people. And then during the year, I meet with them three more times to see how they're doing, what's happening with things they've submitted, help them to shape up manuscripts that maybe got a revise and resubmit. And this is what I find most thrilling, which is helping the next generation, and in this instance, it's the generation after that one, to publish, to be putting their ideas out there. And that that's what I'm most proud of in my editorship. When we think of your work clinically, as I was saying at the beginning of our interview, I think of the words ritual and secret. What got you interested in family rituals and secrets to begin with? Well, let's start with rituals. I was teaching at the University of Massachusetts at the time. I had two wonderful doctoral students, Dick Whiting and and Janine Roberts. And it was a time of the Milan approach, uh, you may recall. Very exciting, not too sure exactly what they were doing, but it looked great. And they talked about therapeutic ritual. It's a type of, many times, paradoxical directive or intervention, yes. They were often these very long, at the end of a session, commentaries that they would say to a family of things to go do at home. And we got very interested in it, but we also grew a little weary of just how therapist-driven this was. 
And we began to find that, in fact, the naturally occurring rituals in families were an outstanding resource for therapy. Things like the daily rituals in a family, mealtime, bedtime for children and adults, how you say goodbye when you leave in the morning, and how you greet each other at the end of the day. And then things like family traditions, those things that are in your household that are not occurring all down the block or in the neighborhood or in the country at the same time, like your birthday or an anniversary. Then holidays, of course, all the different holidays, be they secular or religious, and then life cycle rituals, things like weddings and funerals and and so on. That's where we found we were really getting a lot of traction with families and a lot of success. And most recently, I I did a paper uh, for Family Process on rituals in the time of COVID and looking at how different things have had to be and yet people making rituals. Be they, uh, one, one mother told me, I loved it, having a eat anything you want day once a month for her son <laughs> and how, how much that just tickled this little boy and helped him to get through the period of the pandemic when he had to be locked down at home. And people creating very creative wedding ceremonies during the pandemic when they couldn't have the great big ceremonies. The one that touched my heart the most, I must say, was a couple, an African-American couple, that decided they were going to get married without anybody else there because they knew they couldn't. They went into a church. They, they dressed up in their wedding clothes. They got married. They came out, and out on the street was a Black Lives Matter protest march. The marchers saw this couple, stopped, started cheering them, and the couple then joined the protest march. <laughs> It's, you know, so it's these kinds of things that when you think about rituals, uh, are the kind of rituals that I have meant in my work, they're not stock. They're not the same all the time. They are changing. They are alive. They, they change because we're changing. As you have young children, those young children become adolescents, become young adults, The rituals have to change or they won't stay alive. And we found in our work that if you just talk to people about, for instance, their daily rituals, you can find out so much about family interaction. Are people talking to each other? Are they not talking to each other? Uh, I always love the couples that come in and say, we don't communicate. And I ask them for a typical day, and I find out that they don't communicate, quote, because they're never together. They get home, you know, nine o'clock at night from work, and if it's a heterosexual couple, he goes in his study and she goes in the living room, and that's it, you know. So, yes, there are no daily rituals. Well, that should guide the therapist then to think about how can I begin to introduce just a simple daily ritual for this couple to greet each other when they come home. Even in the most constrained family systems or couples, you see potential for strength and health and rituals. So to be able to tap in to what the family is already doing obviously seems intuitive and very important. Or if they don't have them, to be able to introduce something that is not boilerplate, as you said, something that is specific to the couple or family. Let's talk about how to do that. If I'm working with a family that doesn't have inherently a lot of rituals, how do I work with them in co-constructing something that is a good fit for them? What is the mark of a good family ritual? Question. Well, first of all, I mean, I would I would find out about a typical day 
that that would be the first thing. And that's where I'd look for daily rituals. If there are none, I'd begin to try to find out what would it mean, for instance, to introduce a mealtime twice a week, okay? I mean, you don't want to suddenly say to people who are not doing this at all, you know what, you should be doing this every day (laughs) Uh, because it's not going to happen. So it's much more suggestion than, than assignment, okay? It's much more negotiation, and it's through that. Or if, let's say, you start working with a couple and it's coming up on a major holiday, well, that's a time to ask about how has Thanksgiving been in your family? And you'll hear about family of origin arguments. You'll hear about tensions and so forth. You'll hear about, I don't want to go anymore. (laughs) And then you can begin to coach people about how to go to something like that and have it be different. Do something different than you've done before. So that's that's one of the really important things. I also like, yes, the concept of we have a bad event in our couple or family life. So we can't go back and change that, but we can introduce a new ritual that brings us together instead of tears us apart to kind of overcome that. And I also think, you know, we're talking on the couple level. I think when you're talking about a family ritual, you also have to involve whether they're children or adolescents or teenagers, you have to involve the kids as well. And they have to have some ownership in what the family ritual is. What do you think about on a family level creating rituals? Yes, you do want to involve the children and the adolescents for sure, because they're usually the ones who might be the the least interested. And, you know, at the same time, they may be interested in the stories of your lives and what rituals have been. As we've been talking, Eli, a, a case came to mind of a, a family, a Latinx family, where the husband every year at Christmas would not get out of bed, would not participate, no matter what the wife and children did to try to get him. In the therapy, I just asked a simple question. What was Christmas like when you were a child? And he started to weep, and he talked about his own father, who apparently was an alcoholic, getting not just a little drunk, but wildly drunk on Christmas, and beating this boy, now man, and locking him in a trunk. I mean, it's hard to even fathom. And so for him to not get out of bed, just like, I don't want to deal with this, I don't want to remember any of this, and of course it made him remember it more, I just asked him, what would make a difference? What do you think could help you so that you could enjoy this holiday with your family. And he thought for a moment, and then he looked at his wife, and he said, I know, put on salsa music really loud, and come in and pull me out of bed and dance with me. And you know, it worked. And he was able then to join the family to join the meal, to be together for Christmas, and to change what those horrible memories had been. It made it a new ritual, a new event completely. Yeah, it's a wonderful story to illustrate your point of even working with multi-problem families. I can't go back and change the past, but I can have something to look forward to and change the meaning associated with that day or time of year, depending on what the situation is. Okay, so that's your work with rituals. Now, how did you get interested in studying family secrets? Well, secrets became more uh, of an interest as I saw cases that had secrets. It wasn't, as I said, with the rituals where we started working with the Milan approach and then grew uh, dissatisfied with it. Secrets had more to do with having cases where families had secrets and how to work with those. 
And so that was what interested me and, and got me involved in that topic. And we know, Evan, all secrets are not created equally. There are secrets that are generations long. There are secrets that some members of the system know, but others don't. So if I am starting to get into this work, and it's inherent when you have more than one person in the room, if you're working with couples and families, you're going to, as you said, if you do the work long enough, you're going to come in contact with secrets. So let's orient our listeners how to deal with that. First of all, how do we assess what type of secret it is. And the difference, I think, also between privacy, which we think is good in therapy, and a secret. They're two different things. They're very different. And we certainly want privacy. It would be terrible to have a culture that had no privacy allowed. And so as a therapist, you do need to distinguish what's private and what's secret. Secrets have more to them, I would say, things that can be dangerous, things that can harm relationships, which private matters do not. And so you're, you're looking at that. You're looking to see, is this, is this something that if it stays a secret, then a relationship or a set of relationships are harmed by it, or an individual is harmed by it. And then you want to figure out how to work with it in a good way, in a way that helps people figure out, how do I open this? To whom do I open it? You know, we lived through an age of talk shows. I think there probably still are some, but for for my book, The Secret Life of Families, I watched more talk shows than I ever hoped to watch the rest of my life, where people were encouraged to open, quote, open secrets on national television for the first time. Well, no, when we open a secret, we don't go out on the front lawn and shout it to the neighborhood. We figure out carefully, whether on our own or often with a therapist, who needs to know this? Whose life will be different if I can open this? How will my life be different if I can open this to my mother, my sister, whoever, my spouse? And then what work needs to happen? Because the opening of the secret, unlike what you see on, quote, national television, is just the beginning. It's not the end of the process. It's when you open a secret is when you're going to start to work on what impact has this had on a relationship or a set of relationships. You mentioned, Eli, that there are intergenerational secrets. And yes, there may be finding out something that has been secret for three generations and just keeps coming down the generations where one person knows it and the others don't. And so changing that kind of pattern changes everything in a family. Or it might be something that's just between two people, a couple secret, where one is keeping a secret from the other, often having to do with infidelity, but not always that. It could be money, could be other things as well. Oh, sure, we, we've had shows on financial infidelity that stirs up some of the same emotions that a physical infidelity would. So we could talk about a couple of examples. I think many times the presenting problem is the family or the system is coming to you because this secret has broke. So let's talk about an example like this. I'm uh, thinking of an example of one of these, uh, what you call toxic secrets, where it's a paternity. Somebody finds out, the family has found out that uh, their father is not who they thought their father was. And it is now blown up. So a family is coming to you after the secret has exploded and you as the family therapist are there to help the family try to put the pieces back together and move forward let's talk about a scenario like that where the secret has been outed and that is the reason they're coming to therapy i'd want to know a little more of the backstory how come this was kept a secret to begin with and then how did it open today 
for instance, some of these paternity secrets, you can't keep them because people are doing 23andMe or Ancestry, and before you know it, they're finding out that the person they thought was their father is not their father. So it's, it's different than an earlier time when it was perhaps, quote, easier, though not really, to keep such a secret, but now not so. And so, yes, secrets like that can blow up. A family hopefully will seek a good therapist, a good family therapist at that point. And you want to talk with the parents, perhaps individual, you know, together before bringing in the, the children. Find out their thinking. What was the reason for even keeping such a secret to begin with? Very often people are encouraged by others to, to keep a secret like that. And so, yeah, it's e- it seems easier, and the child is little, and what's the difference anyway? And then, of course, once it opens, it just destroys trust in a family for a period of time. So you want to work on that. You want to find out what were the reasons for keeping the secret to begin with, And now that it's open, what to do about it? For instance, if it is a paternity secret, is there a possibility that this child, depending on age, is capable on their own of searching for their biological parent, should they want to? If they're a young child, do the adults know how to get in touch with the biological parent. And if so, at least get information, if not a meeting yet. There's all kinds of ways that this something like this would be worked with, depending on the family, depending on the, the backstory. Sometimes a biological parent has completely disappeared, and you can't even find them. But they exist. And for the child or children to at least know that story is extremely important in their lives. So that scenario I gave, the secret has already blown up and been revealed. I think there's other times a system, an individual, a couple or family will come in with the idea of should we reveal or not? And I think that is another challenging place for a therapist to be in because all secrets, as you know, Evan, should not necessarily be revealed. So sometimes we focus in the role of helping a couple or a family discern whether it should be revealed or not. I'm thinking of another example that is challenging to deal with, which is somebody's health status. You know, I'm working with a client right now that has HIV and they are very healthy in any other in every other way and they are struggling they have told their partner but they are struggling to tell their adult children because what that would mean and whatever so they are working together to decide should they or should they not tell? So I think we see health status as another one of these family secrets that could present to family therapist. Absolutely. And I think what you as a therapist or I or any of the listeners want to do is help people look at the advantages and disadvantages of opening the secret on each member of the family and on the family as a whole. And that's a process that takes some time. And then there may be the question of, is there one person who is taking the position, say a grandparent, no, you must never do this, you must never open this. I usually encourage people to talk to each member of the family who, who knows the, you know, the secret and get them on board before, for instance, opening the secret with, let's say, a teenage child. Now, you may not get everybody on board, but you'll at least tell them then at a certain point, listen, this is what we've decided to do. This is what's best for our family. So it's, you know, the question I I ask people, who does the secret belong to? Well, 
it belongs to you. And then you have to think about how is it impacting, for instance, your children's lives to not know this about you because it's in the air, okay? It's in when you're visiting this example you gave of a client with HIV who has adult children. There is a tension in that relationship, I would bet, every time they get together that would disappear should that man be able to say to his children, look, I have something to tell you. I've kept it out of a wish to be protective. And a lot of secrets are, are that. It's, it's to protect people, especially children. But now you're adults. I'm an adult. I'm your father. And I want you to know this about me. You see, I think keeping it makes the parent in, in this situation carry a sense of shame all the time when in fact if if he could tell his children that shame would lift and just get blown down the block by a wind which would be much better than having that in the relationship every time he sees his children and the other thing is there are other people who know and you know, and I'm sure your listeners know, that knowledge can be used against people. So if someone knows your secret, they can decide, oh, I think I'll, I think I'll open this without your permission. Better it should come from you than in an unplanned way like that. I agree. You control the narrative and to be able to join with the client on the duality of that, the fear of telling, but also the freedom and the release that can come from that, uh, which is very difficult for some people to sit with, especially if they carry guilt and shame for the secret. You know, secrets can also lead to triangles. In this case, if the, the partner is not on the same page, the partner wants to tell the kids, but the the client with the HIV does not, it becomes a bind and the therapist can easily get triangled into that as well. So we have to be careful not to go into that triangle, which is so inherent to secrets. And I'll give you one more example that will come into a lot of couples therapists. And I have this in my paperwork and in my students that I train. I always, when I'm dealing with a system, either couple or family, I have a no secrets policy in the sense that most of our listeners are familiar with what a no secrets policy is intended to do. It's intended to free the therapist up. Whereas if I was breaking down the system for whatever reason, and let's take a most common example, a couple dyad and I was having an individual meeting Perhaps it was clinically necessitated, or perhaps the other partner was just out of town or didn't show up and they didn't want to cancel. And then in that meeting, uh, if I did not have such a policy as part of my informed consent, the one client tells me, you know, I've been having an affair, but I'm almost done with it. And, you know, this is confidential, so I don't want you to tell my partner. In fact, you can't tell my partner when we're together next time, or as you were alluding to earlier, I have unfortunately gambled a significant amount of money and I'm trying to get it back, but until then, I am just not going to tell my partner. So if an inexperienced couples therapist or a couples therapist without a lot of training gets into a jam like that and does not have such a policy, it becomes very stagnating and really the therapy is handcuffed. What are your thoughts on no secrets policies and how to frame that to new clients, whether they be couples or families. I, I think I differ with you here, Eli. I don't have a no secrets policy because I'm concerned that if I did, there would be important things I would never hear. I would rather hear it, get in the mess, if you will, and try and figure out then what do we need to do? Who needs to know this? if it's in a couple, if it's in a family. I, I just think if you make that absolute, I will not keep secrets, there's going to be a lot of things you're never going to hear that you need to hear. So even in the examples you gave, I would, for instance, say to the client, what, what are you asking of me? You came here to fix your marriage, but 
you've been having an affair, or, well, we've been doing couples therapy, which is uh, always, um, you know, a little difficult to say the least. How do you want to deal with this going forward? Okay, let's play that out. I, I want you, I'm going to end the affair. I just want you to keep it to yourself and not bring it up. I'm going to end it, so it's not going to be a problem. Right. Why did you tell me? I suspect you told me because you want some help figuring out how to open this. That, that would be one thing I might say, okay? Because if somebody tells us something, they're telling us for a reason, <laughs> And particularly if you've been working with this couple and for some reason one spouse couldn't make it to a session and the other one takes the opportunity to say, oh, by the way, I gambled away my family's fortune or I've been having an affair or whatever, I can't help you unless we're able to figure out how to open this. Now, it doesn't need to be next week, but... If you want a relationship going forward that's going to be open, that's going to be honest between you, then we need to figure out how you can talk to your spouse about this. Yes, you create space to try to get them to come along because they told you for a reason, obviously. But if they are adamant that they will never, they will deny. It's not my place to, to, to be the one to say, uh, so next session, I'm opening it. Right. But, and I agree with that. But let's say a scenario is where you know that the content of future sessions, where the partner is questioning the fidelity, either financial or physical, of the spouse, and the spouse is lying. You know the spouse is lying, but you're now you've moved back to this couple modality and there's no reason to change it. So you don't have access to that partner individually anymore to try to reason with them, to help them unburden this, and it really starts to handcuff the therapy. Yeah, well, actually, you, you always have access to individuals within a family or couple therapy so that you might say, you know, the next couple sessions, I'd like to see each of you on your own, and then we'll meet together again or whatever it might be, I wouldn't assume that because I had that one session and the person told me, and now here we are two months later and the therapy is totally stalled out because of this, uh, I wouldn't assume I can't then see that person alone again. Uh, and, and in that session, I, I'm, I might have more leverage to figure out you know, what is it? What what are you so terrified about if your partner knows? Maybe your partner already knows and isn't saying, and so forth. I mean, there are lots of ways to work with that. I, I, I hope you get what I mean when I say that the no secrets policy, I think, puts us as therapists in a spot where we may never hear some really important things that we need to hear from people. And so that's why I don't, I don't say that. Um, I'd, I'd rather get into the mess and then figure out what to do. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I brought that up because that is a hotly debated topic in the field. And, and inherently, when you're doing relational work, as we talk about on this podcast all the time, whether a couple or family, there's more going on. There are certainly, who is the customer? Is it the individual? Is it the couple? Is it the family? And what is your loyalty? And it also brings up the concept of the iatrogenic effects of psychotherapy when we seek to, to help, but in trying to help unintentionally do harm. So I'll, I'll leave you with one final thing around a secret around that. That same scenario, you create the space and try to work with that partner that is having the infidelity. And then they tell their partner, but it comes out that they tell their partner and the therapist, they also, in coming clean, tell their partner that they have told the therapist in, and now the alliance is really jeopardized. It is certainly split. Now, now that injured partner is very hurt that the therapist knew this and chose not to act on it. How do you respond empathically and honestly to that partner 
that has been lied to and probably almost certainly feels lied to by the therapist as well. Okay, so so it's it's not chose not to act on, I would say, Eli. It's timing. So if somebody, you know, if we take the scenario that you presented and somebody in an individual session says to me, I'm having an affair, I'm ending it, but you cannot tell my spouse, yada, yada, yada. I, as I say, I would try to do some work with that person. I would try to find out what they are most afraid will happen and what will happen when the person inevitably does find out, because they will. Now, if then uh, the, 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 let's say, I don't know, six weeks goes by and they decide to tell their spouse and they tell their spouse and you know what, Evan Ember Black knew for the last six weeks. Well, yes, for sure that person is going to be upset with me and I've got work to do. I'm going to meet them alone. I'm going to talk to them about their partner needing some time and that I have been encouraging their partner to A, end this, and B, talk to you about it. But things don't happen instantly. You know, we live in a time where people think things do happen instantly, but in fact they don't. And so I I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I would do what I could to mend my relationship with that other with the other partner the partner who who uh, feels betrayed by me i brought that up to challenge you but also to reflect that it is every situation is different and you have to weigh in all those factors but certainly the argument why not to is because the belief that it limits what you can find out about uh, that individual or that couple or that family I think a situation also that people can relate to is when you're working with a teenager, doing work within the context of a a family system, the modality is family therapy, but you have individual sessions with the teenager and the parents. I think therapists are more likely, unless it is to do with imminent harm to self or other, keep secrets from teenagers and build more of an alliance with that. I feel around infidelity, however, it really strikes home with people and that is a, a secret different than potentially holding that your teenager is experimenting with drugs and alcohol or sneaking out to hang out with people the parents don't want with it. So it is certainly the context, the nature of the secret, and also really what the the goals of the therapy are. If the goals of the, the therapy are around trust and transparency and the person is having an affair, it, it why then again why are you telling me and why are you here i think those are are valid questions and and probably that person wants help or they wouldn't be telling you well see it's either it's one of two things either they want help or they're trying to tie my hands and i would ask that which is it what what are we doing here when you say to me and you can't tell my my uh, husband or you can't tell my wife or you know my partner you told me for a reason let's talk about the reason what is it you're looking for because you know it may well be that it happens i think you and all the listeners know that it happens that sometimes people tell us something to tie our hands and that's a contract I don't want to buy. Uh, along with that, another secret people have is their motivation for coming. They tell their partner, I want to come to couples therapy. But really, the secret is, I don't want to be married to you anymore. And I'm coming here to drop you off in safekeeping of the therapist so I can exit. I think that's also a secret that many systemic couple and family therapists deal with. Absolutely, and it's something that I always teach my students that, you know, you will have people. It's it's more rare, thankfully, who come in uh, with the idea of being able to say, see, I've tried everything, even couples therapy, and it didn't work, and so it's time for, you know, me to leave or, or, or whatever, however it's framed. Yes, there are people who come in with that as their intention, their motivation. They'll try six sessions and say, that's it, see, doesn't work. 
uh, this is the end of our marriage. Evan Ember Black, I cannot thank you enough. We've had a very spirited discussion covering your origins in the field, really seeing so much change in our field and your 50 years of professional experience from seeing those masters of family therapy in the golden age when you started to going through the postmodern movement, the feminist critique, where you were an active part of, along with so many other strong, powerful female voices and really ending with great discussions on rituals and how to handle family secrets. If our listeners want to correspond with you, you're still very active. You still are an educator, trainer, writer. How can our listeners continue the dialogue with you if they'd like to? Yeah, they can email me at eimberblack, all lowercase, at mercy, M-E-R-C-Y dot E-D-U. And I'll be happy to respond. Eli, back with you, bringing to a close another thought-provoking episode of the AAMFT podcast. It's always a thought-provoking conversation, even when we necessarily don't agree. And Evan helped us think about a few things, and people have strong feelings about especially family secrets. So what was your feeling? Were you more on the side of sometimes therapists should or keep secrets, as Evan indicated, or were you more like me that believes firmly in this no secrets policy and that the therapist is somehow handcuffed without that. So it's a thought provoking topic for sure. We'd love to hear your input on that. As always, get a hold of me at Eli at NorthstarCounselingCenter.com. You can also participate in the conversation on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Eli Live. AMFT is at the AAMFT. For a deeper dive, Evan has edited two books on our topics today. The first is Rituals and Families and Family Therapy, published by Norton, edited by Evan, Janine Roberts, and Richard Whiting. And then Secrets in Family Therapy, and that's also from Norton, edited by Evan Ember Black. In addition to dropping me a line, we always value your feedback about future guests and future topics on the show. I appreciate those listeners that I've heard from lately, and we do take that into consideration when we're planning our next seasons of shows. And if you've missed out on anything in our previous four seasons, they're all available wherever you find your favorite podcast. I'm partial to Apple Podcasts, but you can go to Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play. They're all there. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, my friends, stay safe, stay systemic.